Welcome to this month's Platinum webinar for Conan Fitness. Um, this month we're looking at cardiovascular endurance. By memory, for those that were with us on our basic training guidelines webinar, we went through the different parameters or the different components of fitness, cardiovascular endurance just being one of those. So we're specifically honing in on that one uh, in this webinar. And all of the factors that limit or you know improve cardiovascular endurance and what steps or measures we can take in our training to try and improve each of those little factors each of those parameters essentially we're going to take a look at the life of a a, a journey of an oxygen molecule from out in the air to the actual working muscle where it's used and how we can improve that that being the main factor of cardiovascular endurance so if you have a look at it these are the kind of steps as a bit of an overview if you look here the first step uh, in cardiovascular endurance um, from a general perspective is, is oxygen. It all comes down to oxygen coming into, you know, breathing it in from the air into our lungs. Once it's in our lungs, it goes through the alveolo into the, uh, from the lungs into the bloodstream and you see the blood capillaries. Once it's in the bloodstream, it's got to be transported uh, to the working muscles and then obviously it's got to get into the working muscles and everything from that point on then kind of comes down to uh, muscular endurance, as in specific local muscular endurance, which, as we mentioned last time, is a slightly different parameter. So while it all works together to, pro, um, to provide cardiovascular endurance and to improve it, we're just looking at all of the steps up to the muscle today, and we'll look at the, what happens inside the muscle at a later date. Let's quickly look at some definitions first. However, you'll hear lots of terms uh, when you're doing your training, whether it's running or cycling or swimming or just weights or something like that. You hear terms like aerobic threshold, anaerobic threshold, um, lactate threshold, and you hear VO2 max. VO2 max is what we want to talk on most uh, tonight. But just quickly, with aerobic threshold, that's a really loose term, actually. Um, some of these uh, are thrown around quite loosely. While there are technical um, you know, definitions, aerobic is interesting because there's no real specific point of aerobic threshold. There is for blood lactate and what's called onset of blood lactate, lactate accumulation. But aerobic threshold, sometimes called ventilated threshold, is kind of like the point where um, at a certain intensity, aerobic metabolism, that is uh, metabolism that you know predominates from the use of oxygen, um, is the main source of energy production at that level of intensity. As the intensity rises, then anaerobic metabolism starts to play a more predominant role. However, the interesting thing is that aerobic metabolism is always working and anaerobic metabolism is always working, even at rest. It's just that it provides such a low percentage of your energy needs that it's just, you know, it's almost irrelevant, uh, anaerobic at rest. But as the intensity increases, aerobic metabolism still increases and it increases linearly. Uh, anaerobic metabolism aims to increase linearly in a linear fashion. However, lactate, which is a byproduct of anaerobic metabolism or glycolysis, the glycolytic pathway of anaerobic metabolism, that gets to a point where its increase no longer is linear and it becomes almost exponential. And the point where that starts to become exponential, that's what's called the um, onset of blood lactate accumulation, OBLA, or more specifically, the lactate threshold. Uh, and lactate threshold, anaerobic threshold, they're used synonymously because that's a little bit more of a, a physiological point that we can measure. You see aerobic threshold, they say loosely defined, it's kind of when blood lactate hits about 2 millimoles per litre. Just as a heads up, rest is usually about one, around about one millimole per litre. So when it gets to about double, it says, all right, we're probably hitting the aerobic threshold, but it's not a very, other, other than the lactate uh, method of measuring, it's not really uh, specific. Anaerobic threshold, however, is interesting because within a muscle, there is the glycolytic energy, that's the anaerobic uh, metabolism, you know, like uh, metabolizing glycogen or glucose, without the use of oxygen. And the byproduct of that, of that is lactic acid, as we know, and that happens within the muscle. Now, what happens to a lactic acid uh, molecule is that it's, it then gets broken down into a lactate molecule and acids, as in literally hydrogen ions, hence the term acid. 
the hydrogen ions are what create the whole acid feeling, not so much the lactate itself. It's the, the hydrogen ions, the um, acid, the acidosis, what they call it. That's where we feel the burn, not the lactate. The lactate itself has one of two fates. It's actually used. It's actually an energy source. So once um, it gets broken down to lactic acid, and then the lactic acid is broken into lactate and hydrogen ion, that lactate either gets used in aerobic metabolism again as an energy source. Or if there's not, and then oxygen has to be present, but if there's not enough oxygen, then it just gets spilled over into the bloodstream as, uh, as lactate. Um, so what we've got is uh, if oxygen is present and is being supplied in, you know, in, in, to, to meet the demand, then basically the buildup of lactic acid or lactate kind of equals the rate at which it's metabolized aerobically so it never really builds up any faster it just kind of gets built up gets broken down it builds up gets broken down however there is the point where intensity increases so much that the rate of um, breaking down the, the lactic acid to lactate and utilizing it in aerobic metabolism is is outweighed by the um, production of it and that's the point where lactate spills into the blood hence uh, the, the sharp raise, raise in lactate levels called onset of blood lactate. And that's the specific point of anaerobic uh, threshold or lactate threshold. And they say it's when blood lactate hits about four millimoles per litre. Um, so at least you can measure that. VO2 max, on the other hand, that all comes down to the maximum capacity of the body to transport and utilise oxygen. It all comes down to oxygen. The maximum volume in litres, so it's literally... We measure the liters of oxygen that can be um, that the body can uptake, and it's either measured um, just like the the raw figure, which is liters per minute, or more specifically, uh, liter milliliters per kilogram per minute, which is actually a better measure for VO2 max. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Since cardiovascular fitness has so much to do with the availability of oxygen, we're going to go through all the parameters that affect VO2 max, that, that maximum capacity for the body to transport and utilize oxygen. So let's have a look at them now. We mentioned the first step is that oxygen molecules out here in the, you know, out in the universe, and we breathe that into the lungs. So the first step is getting it into the lungs. The limiting factors are lung volume. So the more lung volume we can get, which you can improve through things like breathing exercises, you know, yoga and uh, diaphragm intercostal muscles, so the, the, the muscles that affect uh, the you know the, the lungs um, breathing in and out, and the alveoli, they're the little sacs within the, the lungs. Um, the more of them we have, the greater surface area, and lungs is all about surface area. Peak flow is another limiting factor. That's the actual airways themselves. So you know the bronchial trachea, you know the actual yeah where the air um, passes through passes through the airways. If they are constricted, kind of like asthma, then it restricts the rate at which air can get out or get in for that matter. So breathing exercise and airway dilators like, you know, your ventilators, and that's kind of only if you need it, but it is a factor. Once we're in the lungs, what we've then got are these alveoli. So these are the little sacs that are in your lungs, and they just provide the surface area. And they are surrounded by capillaries, as you can see, the red, the, the, the blood vessels there. Now, what happens during training? when we re the, meet the right training stimulus is we literally get an increased capillarization. And that is that the it literally grows more, as you can see down here, grows more capillaries around the alveoli so that we've increased the surface area between alveoli, which is your lungs, and the touching surface of red blood vessels. So the more surface area there is between blood vessel touching alveoli, the more diffusion you're able to get, as in the oxygen diffusing from the lungs through those barriers into the actual bloodstream. So that's capillarization, very important and a very big part of increasing how much oxygen we can get into the blood. Once we're into the blood, then there's several factors within the actual cardiovascular system that limit how much oxygen carrying capacity we've got. And the first thing is red blood cells. So red blood cells are the things that actually um, have the hemoglobin on it. We'll get onto hemoglobin next, but hemoglobin is the molecule that actually hold or bind oxygen. So red blood cells themselves, they're the only um, cells in the blood that 
that have the hemoglobin as far as holding oxygen. And we can increase red blood cells by things like altitude training. It's not that practical for everyone, but at high altitudes where uh, you know oxygen content is lower, the body literally produces more. The way they do it in sport is the old doping. It's illegal, but uh, what they would do is take red blood cells out of their body so that the body naturally builds its own stores back up. And once it's back up to normal levels, they put those original blood cells back in um, so that they've got an increased amount and, and it literally increases the amount of oxygen that you can carry in your blood. As far as the more practical things, hemoglobin. Now, each hemoglobin molecule that sits on a red blood cell can carry four molecules of oxygen. Uh, that's the max it can hold but you can have more hemoglobin molecules on the red blood cells. So things like iron and ferritin intake, because heme, that, that's actually an iron component. So that's why iron is so important, important in energy. If someone's low in iron, they are low in their oxygen carrying capacity. And things like smoking, uh, don't smoke, as in the breathing in of carbon monoxide, it, it latches onto these hemoglobin molecules and basically takes up one of those four precious spots that an oxygen molecule can get on, onto. So uh, a good way to decrease cardiovascular endurance is smoking, so take that out. Cardiac output is important. So when it comes to the heart, with each beat of the heart, a certain volume of blood is squirted out, and that's called cardiac output. So, um, well, that, sorry, that's one parameter of cardiac output, the other factor is how fast it's beating, heart rate. But heart rate aside, with each beat, how much um, volume, that's called stroke volume, is very important because the more volume we pump out with each beat, the more blood goes around the body, which means the heart rate doesn't have to beat as fast. So a higher stroke volume equals lower heart rate, so you're able to maintain your same intensity or lower heart rate. And that's why hydration is so important because when the blood volume gets low, and you know that hydration is in most of the blood content is water. So when our water levels get low, the blood volume starts to get low, and that means every beat of the heart is pumping out less blood. So therefore, it has to beat faster just to get the same amount of blood around the body. So cardiac output and hydration so important. Once we get to the level of the muscle, like I said, this is when it kind of gets into muscle endurance. But there are several factors that are very important in improving cardiovascular endurance or that oxygen carrying, uh, sorry, the, the utilize, utilization of oxygen. And that is that here you can see our muscle, obviously, but these are the fibers of the muscle. And ignoring the nerve picture there, the red vessels, the red blood vessels, they're the capillaries around the muscle. And just like we had... Uh, increased capillarization around the alveolar of the lungs, the same thing happens at a localized uh, muscle, at the muscle level, where we literally get an increase in the capillaries, the, the vascularity around the muscles, so that more um, oxygen can pass from the muscles, because it only happens through surface area, and it diffuses it into the muscle cell. Once it's into the muscle cell, we've got things like mitochondrial density and aerobic enzyme activity that we can improve through certain parameters of training. But again, we're going to get into that in the next webinar when we talk about uh, local muscle endurance because that's a slightly separate component of fitness, um, although they obviously all work together to improve VO2 max. But so far, we've seen the journey of an oxygen molecule from the um, universe into the lungs, into the blood, around the bloodstream, into the, so to the surface of the muscle. And once it's into the muscle, many steps along the way have we seen. And if we had to in in, increase those by just a small amount, like for instance lung volume, or the capillarization, or the red blood cells, or the hemoglobin, or the capillaries around the muscle, or the stroke volume, as in the heart, the cardiac output. To increase each of those by just a small amount, even like five, oops, even like five percent, then it's kind of like compound growth, where you're not just getting five plus five plus five. It's uh, the growth of one on top of the growth of another on top of the growth of another. So putting it all together and to wrap up, to try and increase our VO2, uh, our, our VO2 max from all of these levels up to the muscle, which we won't go into tonight, what we can do is firstly build a solid aerobic base. So that means your time spent training in the aerobic zone. And remember, the aerobic zone is under anaerobic, zone, anaerobic thre threshold. In fact, well under, because there's a big difference between that aerobic threshold and anaerobic threshold. 
Then on top of that solid aerobic base, then we throw in the sessions, regular sessions that are, that is at aerobic, th uh, sorry, anaerobic threshold or even slightly above. Now, we wouldn't go too far over for these just because you can't maintain it. As long as you're at or slightly above the anaerobic threshold, that is the stimulus where the body is struggling in all those parameters, struggling to, to provide the oxygen at the rate for supply, uh, demand to equal supply. So it is a stimulus for it to improve the most, uh, you know, all those little factors along the way. And finally, we can put in some semi-regular sessions at or above VO2 max. And VO2 max is the absolute max of uh, your um, oxygen carrying capacity. So they're generally quite tough sessions and they generally have to be interval based just because it's, it's impossible to train at that level of intensity for long duration. So um, generally you'll go into the VO2 max and then give it a little bit of a rest to go into the VO2 max and give it a little bit of a rest. So there you go, folks, putting it all together, the life of an oxygen molecule or the journey of an oxygen molecule to the muscle cell, um, putting those factors together and understanding what's happening at those at the specific levels all along the way, that there is huge amounts of potential of increase for the VO2 max and therefore cardiovascular endurance and the body's ability to, to transport and utilize oxygen and therefore to be able to uptake, to be able to uptake a larger volume of oxygen every minute. Until next month, enjoy.